You need more than music to run a music player. We have this idea or principle at Spotify that you're collectively responsible, individually accountable, but collectively responsible. Once they have the autonomy, they will come up with better ideas, better products, better service for customers. So we want people to be engaged, empowered, part of a solving problems. We still want to keep this level of autonomy. We want that people should feel that they're part of, of uh, establishing direction, that they have access to leaders and others. If you want to be autonomous, well, then we have to kind of give up uh, working uh, towards the same goal. If people should feel that they can influence what's what's being built. The chapter model is great for, for actually, you know, building an engineering culture and craftsmanship culture and uh, you know, we're all in this together. Find the right balance, which allows you to not have the chaos, but also have the freedom. I find that I, I have to coach the manager, right? And not the team. Transformations, you can't buy it. You need to sweat it. All right, welcome everyone to, to di today's um, Agile Insights conversation. Today I'm hosting Joachim Sunden, and uh, Joachim uh, has worked with Spotify for many years, has now been an agile, an external agile coach for many years, and I'm sure he's going to share so many really, really good insights with us. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation, especially as a week or two ago, Joachim, correct me if that's wrong, you had a webinar where you compared the Spotify model with the Skate Agile Framework. I found that very insightful. I participated for the for the full webinar. Yeah, you also uh, shared your, your your deck with other people, and maybe there's a recording of and that which we could then also link to this uh, to this conversation. Okay. So, with that said, Joachim, welcome to the show. It's great having you with us. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Yeah. No idea to what what to expect. Also, so, no idea so, what to expect. No, I have, I, I have an idea of what to expect. So, what I want to do today to Joachim is to do the following things. First of all, I think it's great for our audience to to get to know you a bit better. Now, you and I got to know each other a bit better. Our audience doesn't know you yet. So, initially, I will provide some time and space for you to introduce yourself. Then, I want to talk with you about Spotify, about the early days that you got started there how you set up things, how this whole thing that a lot of people refer to as the Spotify model, how this came into existence, right? What were the pains that you were feeling? How, what kind of experiments did you run? What kind of patterns emerged as something, as something that, is, that is valuable? And then I want to take this conversation to other organizations because I know from the conversations you and I had in the past that you have been working with a lot of organizations. My assumption is in various industries, and you have to some extent adopted the model or the patterns that you found useful within your context at Spotify into those other organizations. And I want to evaluate with you without naming those organizations. If, if it's possible, great. If not, I understand. But without naming those organizations, I want to evaluate with you which of these patterns worked well and which of these patterns didn't work that well. And you had to make adaptations as you were working with those organizations. So that would be the focus of today's conversation. And I'm sure based on the stories that you share with us or with me in this case, I have, I'm going to have so many more questions and then we'll see how we fit all of that into our time box. So a very warm welcome. And I think we just get started with your introduction with getting to know you, Aki. Okay, thank you. Well, first off, my, my name in Swedish, it's actually pronounced Joachim. Joachim, Joachim. Sundin. Uh, Joachim. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it, you did a pretty good job, uh, uh, English speakers. Uh, native English speakers have even more difficulty understanding the, the J. Uh, but uh, yeah, Joachim Sundin, I'm uh, from Sweden, uh, north of Sweden originally. Uh, and uh, I now live outside of Stockholm. And uh, as you mentioned, I was with Spotify from 2011 to 2017. I'm working mainly in the headquarters in Stockholm, uh, but also then working with our San Francisco and New York teams. And then when we acquired a company in Boston, uh, we leave them be for maybe a year. Then I uh, actually uh, moved out there and, and worked for a couple of years in, in, uh, in Boston and then with the New York uh, teams as well. And since 2017, I've been with Crisp, small boutique consultancy in Sweden, uh, Henrik Nyberg, Reza Ferrang, and uh, some other uh, semi-famous people uh, that, that also works here, like 25 consultants and so on. Used to be a developer, an architect, but that almost feels like a, a, you know another lifetime. It's been very long since I, I wrote a line of code. Father of four, husband, 
uh, love TV shows, cocktails, and good food. So yeah. that's me. They're so great. Joachim, thanks, thanks for this brief introduction. You mentioned TV shows. Uh, recently, um, the TV show was published on Netflix about Spotify. I first saw yeah. it in one of your LinkedIn posts. I, I started watching it. I binged watched it. It was, it was super interesting. Now, obviously, that's a TV show, but using that as a, as a segue, uh, walk us through some of the early days at Spotify. You mentioned you joined in 2011. How big was the company back then? And what was your role? What, 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 what did they hire you for? Yeah, so uh, actually, while it was kind of the early days, it wasn't the, the really early days. So what you can see in the TV show, the playlist on Netflix, uh, that's when there were just a group of people uh, developing the, the first version, really, of, of the client. Uh, when I got into Spotify, there was a, a million subscribers. Uh, we just were about to, to launch in, in the US, which was a big market. So there were maybe a couple of hundred people. Uh, we were in... in you know, technology and product, there were around maybe eight teams or something. And they have just started to, you know, push into uh, really go into the challenges of, of uh, scaling. And I'd been investigating some time in, in, into that and, and, you know, seeing that with clients that everything that was so easy with just one or, or even a few teams, actually already with a few teams, uh, all that you have natural in a small one and, and so on get, gets more complicated. And you could have teams working alongside each other and, and uh, for years uh, almost and, and not really talking to each other, not understanding that we share the same goals. We have the same problems. You've actually solved some of them and we didn't even know. So I took an interest in learning organizations, visited Toyota and Toyota's headquarter uh, together with some crisp people actually back then and, and Tom and Mary Poppendick. So this was uh, and I organized a, a, and co-organized a couple of conferences in Sweden. And that's where I met the first Scrum Master at, at uh, Spotify. And she was talking about these struggles and she had a similar view like me that, uh, you know, uh, scrum fanatics, uh, please, uh, you, you know, it, it's not what scrum says or, or, or doesn't say. I was kind of active in the lean Kanban community, uh, wrote a book called Kanban in Action. So I was more of, you know, pragmatically figuring out new ways of working, what works, what doesn't, and, and try to take a more scientific approach to it, even if that's maybe a exaggeration, but a little bit more learning and inspecting and adapting and so on. So uh, she hired me. Uh, and uh, so I was one of the first agile coaches. We pretty quickly decided that uh, we're not working with Scrum. We're very experienced. We're working with several teams and leadership. Uh, we're actually agile coaches, but it wasn't a widely used uh, term back then. Uh, mm -hmm. This had been 2011. Bradley Sadkin's book, Coaching Agile Teams, and, and that uh, influenced a, a lot of how we shaped the Agile coaching role at Spotify. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I left, we were 50 uh, Agile coaches uh, at Spotify, uh, and uh, many of them uh, I was uh, part of hiring or, or they were hired by people I hired in turn. So, so I think that book and the, the early days had uh, quite an influence on, on, on the growth. Yeah. So sorry, I, I, maybe I lost track of the original question there. But no, 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 no. All, all good, all good. You gave us a bit of context, which which was the state in two, uh, 2011 when you joined. Eight teams, one Scrum master. You just joined a few other people, and you already started talking about some of the challenges that those eight teams, or maybe even f when they were fewer teams, were facing. Walk us a bit more yeah. through the challenges because. Usually based out of those challenges, the need comes up to change the way we work, to change the way we collaborate, to, to change the way we scale or think about scaling in the first place. So if you can help us with a bit more of that context of the challenges, I think that would be fantastic. Sure. So uh, in, in, um, in the even earlier days, before I started, uh, I learned through, through the Spotify lore that, that was, uh, you know, uh, told uh, as, as stories. Uh, we, we, we actually like to tell stories a lot at Spotify. Uh, you know, there's an anthropologist, Clifford Gertz, who says the, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, that's our culture. Mm. So we came up with ways to, to reinforce that. And, and one story was that, uh, you know, there was chaos uh, when we grew, uh, everything that we could take care of naturally in the beginning. And, uh, you know, Daniel, the founder and CEO, could just swivel his chair around and address the entire company. And, and now we were several teams and, and people were stressed out and, and, you know, reinventing the wheel and not re really understanding. And some people started complaining that, 
if this chaos is going to go on, I'll quit. I, I can't can't live with this. So uh, someone made the decision to bring in a scrum trainer for something silly like half a day or, or, or something like that to train the, the, the entire teams. And uh, it, it somehow it became really prescriptive. You know, you should do an estimate of a minimum and a maximum and an average and then time three and add the maximum and minimum, divide it by five. And this is how you should do the sprint planning. It's very detailed and prescriptive. Mm -hmm. And then sure enough, some people said, if this is going to go on, uh, I'll quit. Uh, so, so that became a, a metaphor for the constant struggle of how can we find the right agile culture that balances between, you know, not ending up in chaos and, and uh, no, no order but not over constrain uh, ourselves with autonomy. Mm -hmm. So we want people to be engaged, empowered, part of uh, sol solving problems. And, and we hired a CTO uh, who was actually the one who started hiring Scrum Masters and Agile Coaches, Oscar Stoll. And, and he was uh, he had successfully taken a, a startup uh, through scale up to with using lean agile methods. And he was the one talking about and figuring things out like the autonomous squad is the center of our organization. All other features should be designed to support that autonomous squad. So that became also the, the big challenge as we scaled. How can we you know, keep this autonomy, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually exactly what people these days talk about as empowered product teams. Uh, so how can the, 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 the engineers really be the ones involved in driving what should we be doing, not just how we should be doing it, but given problems to solve or goals? And speaking about the playlist, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff wrong with it, but I like one thing where they, where they you know, it, it has to be really, really fast. It has to be really, really fast. That, that what he was really driving that objective. And then who's going to figure out what, what features should we build? How should we solve these things? And, and you know, engineers would, would, would come up with the solutions. But as we grow, that becomes really tricky. You know, how, how, do, we, how do we bring some, you know, we, we, we still, we're still one company and one experience for the user. How can we stay aligned uh, while keeping this autonomy? Because traditionally the, the view had been, you know, if, if, uh, if we want to be aligned, then we can't be autonomous. Yes. If we want to be autonomous, yeah. well, then we have to kind of give up uh, working uh, towards the same goal. It's more uh, like a th let a thousand uh, flowers bloom kind yes. of uh, yes. uh, idea and see if see what sticks, uh, you know, which can work, <laughs> I guess, in in the early days, but but harder when you want to want to scale up and grow. When you scale up and you want and you want to provide a consistent user experience across multiple platforms and multiple features, and I think what you just mentioned, the autonomy and alignment piece, that's where. Henrik's famous two by two came up, right? When you have autonomy on one axis, alignment on the other, and then you want to be at the very top, high levels of autonomy and high level of alignment. And actually those high levels of alignment enable the high levels of autonomy. Now you mentioned a few, a few things that I already wrote it down. Um, one that it was becoming to some extent from chaos to too prescriptive. And I've seen this in many organizations and you wanted to find the right balance, which allows you to not have the chaos, but also have the freedom. The other thing that you mentioned, and I also saw this in the Netflix series, that the autonomous squads, and in the Netflix series, they mentioned several times, the engineers should be the star of the organization, right? And when I think about yep. many of the companies that I work with, they want to do all of these things, even apply the Spotify model, but rarely ever, do they think about the people in the development, in the, in the teams, in the squads, right? Whatever term we want to use, being the star of the organization and everyone else or everything in the organization is created in a way so that they can do the best job they can do, right? They are still seen in many cases as a feature factory that is driven. And I think that was also one of the key messages you shared in your comparison between the Spotify model and scaled agile framework where, yeah, in, in safe, we do have those teams, but they're not really that autonomous. They're not really driving uh, the way the solutionizing towards certain objectives that are set from above. But I think this is something that I want to dive deeper on a bit later. Now, you shared a bit yep. about the challenges that those, that those teams or that the organization was facing. It was about synchronization. It was about alignment. It was about providing a consistent user experience, all of those things. 
What were some of the initial experiments that you ran when you still had those eight teams, maybe now nine or 10 teams? And which of those experiments turned out to be patterns of the later Spotify model? And which were things that you like very quickly identified, oh, this isn't working. We need to think about something else. Right. Uh, so... Um... It's it's actually uh, with with time it becomes uh, harder to remember the the failed <laughs> experiments actually, uh, but we we uh, I remember a few, uh, but I could say also that we we didn't really realize the extent of the challenge. Uh, but uh, uh, one thing that I, one of the first things that I did as an agile coach was to bring in Jeff Patton uh, to teach his passionate product owner class uh, with use of story mapping and. And he was re really brandishing this uh, empowered, he didn't use the term, but you, you know, he, he had been collaborating with Marty Kagan and so on. Uh, and people were reading Marty Kagan's book, Inspired in, in mm -hmm. product. Uh, but this was still when we could fit all the product managers or product owners, as we called it back then, uh, the engineering managers and, and the designers into the same room. And, and I remember we had dinner with Jeff in the evening and, and he was saying, you, you know, this autonomy idea that you have going, you know, to the user, it's still just one experience. Aren't you concerned that it will be, become fragmented and so on? And we were like, no, 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 that's not going to happen. You know, we're talking to each other and collaborating. But, but sure enough, uh, the, just a year later, I think it was the, the CPO took the stage in, in an internal meeting and or a town hall and said, you know, look at their client. You can actually see one squad has built this thing, another squad has built that thing. It's not consistent. It's confusing. It doesn't work in the same way. And we were like, "Oh shit! Yeah, we should have listened to Jeff. Uh, wh why didn't we?" So, so I think we could have brought more alignment uh, when it came to to design and user experience in the beginning. Uh, so what we ended up doing was bringing Rochelle King in from from Netflix, and and uh, she she became the director of design and really built strong. Uh, UX and, and and design capabilities, uh, and uh, I think everyone, you know, in hindsight, why why didn't we do that earlier? Uh, probably We're because you know, a lot of <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but a lot of the companies at that time, you know, you you view design as as still a little bit as something that's happening up front, and you have an internal agency design approach, uh, uh, but but uh, yeah, that doesn't really really scale in 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 an autonomous world. Uh, some of the things that we did was um, uh, early on, uh, we also had, uh, uh, well, let's say product managers. Uh, my, maybe we haven't had not developed uh, the culture strongly enough, and, and they were also coming maybe from a background where, where they were used to push, 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 push. And it wasn't always the case that the engineers were comfortable pushing back and saying, yeah, yeah wait, but but, you know, and that was uh, one of the drawbacks of using the chapter model, we, meaning that you know we have a matrix model. So, so the engineering managers or chapter leads, they were uh, you know explicitly taken uh, off uh, being responsible for uh, for the technical parts and so on, and only for people development. Mm -hmm. We really wanted to to uh, you know turn the dial full on uh, to not have them become mi micromanagers, which, which was a risk that we were, were guarding against. But at the cost sometimes of, uh, you know, but who's going to, you know, stand up to the sometimes short sightedness of the product manager because they were kind of used to get that pushback. Um, and we started to insert uh, tech leads. Uh, but that was uh, something that was pretty quickly rejected by the system, so to speak, uh, because, uh, you know, it, it might have helped some squads that had that problem. But in others, where it wasn't a problem, it was kind of why do we want one of us to be, you know, the tech lead, and you know, every everyone should be involved, and it, it depends so much on on, on which uh, competence is being used and so on. So those are two examples of, of I would say failed experiments, and that doesn't mean that we won't try it again because years later we try the tech lead technical owner thing again, didn't work out uh, then either, by the way. Uh, but uh, another thing. Uh, and, and this is this is a funny story, actually. The, the reason why we introduced tribes or the trigger that, that we used to introduce the tribes, which is basically a team of teams, agile release training, say, safe terms, or, or maybe requirement area if you're less is your thing. So a team of teams. Uh, 
And remember, this was back in 2011, 20, early 2012. There was no safe. I mean, it was maybe taking shape. There, there was no less. We, we read Bass Waters and Craig Lorman's books, uh, but that was just uh, lots of different practices and patterns, yeah. and, and some of yeah. them we liked and some of them we tried, but, but there were no scaling frameworks. So we kind of had to find our own approach. But it was triggered by the CTO having, you know, I have too many direct reports. Uh, I can't manage this. Uh, as a rule of thumb, we said you should only have 10 direct reports, or otherwise you won't be able to give them the time. And he maybe had 20. And, uh, you know, in, in meetings with, with his reports, uh, no one could get airtime or help and support. So, so it was ma- driven very much from practical reasons for him. You know, we need to add hierarchy to which uh, re- agile coaches reacted very strongly. You know, oh, should we really be adding more layers of hierarchy just because, you, you know, you had a problem and... Uh, but he kept pushing and, and uh, you know, the, the, the struggle is real. And uh, so we, we started taking a step back. Okay, what do we actually try to, what, what do we want to accomplish? And we really wanted, you know, we want this, this feeling of, of the old days when, you know, everyone knew each other, you knew who to go to for help. These days, you know, you're walking down the hall and you're not sure, is this a visitor? Is this a new guy? Uh, I don't know. Uh, who do I go to when I need something? Uh, I don't know. There are new people. They've reorganized and... So can we get this relatedness, you know, uh, lowering the bar for actually asking for help? And I know who to go to and we have a relation. And so they will likely also help me because, oh, I know who you are and we're in the same context. So that was was what what the tribe was uh, was about. So we wanted to also the dependencies to be able to be handled within the tribe as much as possible because, you know, natural collaboration can still happen in that size. The reason why we came up with the name Tribe was, uh, well, I studied social anthropology, and I think we read about the Dunbar number in, in, in Craig's and, and Bass's books. Uh, so that was, you know, Dunbar, the social anthropologist who studied uh, tribes, among other uh, groups, and found that there's a limit to the amount of people that you can, you know, have meaningful social re- relationships with. So that's what the, where the idea to, to call it Tribe uh, uh, was born. And... Uh, but what I think was good was that the leadership teams and uh, some leaders, some agile coaches and the CTO, we really tried to address, okay, what are we trying to, to, to do? And we, we still want to keep this level of autonomy. We want that people should feel that they're part of, of uh, establishing direction, that they have access to leaders and others. Those things we were, th- those were things we were thinking about. And then we considered risks. And then we actually said, okay, how do we measure if this is working in, in the way that we think it is? So we started going around when we introduced the tribes, we started going around to the squads and, and uh, uh, every two weeks or so and asking them, who do you have dependencies to? Uh, how is that impacting you? Uh, to, to just see, okay, do we need to make some tweaks and adjustments and changes and so on? And actually that when you do user research, you sometimes talk about uh, evaluative questions, mm-hmm. which that was, but you often also get generative knowledge. You know, I'm just talking to people and understanding how this is working. You, you 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 understand things and and some we, we actually asked how is this dependency impacting you and some of them said uh, you know this dependency isn't isn't impacting us at all and this is really impacting us and then why why, why is there such such a difference and we noticed that the the dependencies that weren't impactful it was more like collaborations well we know that people and and, uh, and because you know we're not a hierarchical organization i'll just go over there and talk to them when we need their help and things will get done this squad, on the other hand, you know, there's, they're in New York. We don't know them, and we want something. We we file a ticket in Jira, or we, ah, okay, and, and so that armed us with the knowledge. Well, okay, then we know how we can turn bad dependencies into good collaborations. You know, just having people embedded in different teams, or or going from one team to another to teach them and, and create relationships and, and investing in that. And that, I think, to finish this off. It's an underestimated part of, of the Spotify model, so to speak. The, the one team culture and this relatedness and really building this sense of strong community within the tribe mm-hmm. and building a culture. And, 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 and as you saw maybe in the safe versus Spotify model talk, I think that's harder if you have a virtual organization where people are reporting to every part of the organization. It's not nearly really the responsibility of the leaders in the tribe to develop the people in the tribe. But it's you know someone else uh, who also have people in other different tribes and they can't really focus. Yeah, so that's a that's a very interesting point, and I love that piece of building a culture within within a tribe. But let's take a step back. A tribe you mentioned is a team of teams, similar to an agile release train or a requirement area, etc. 
How did you basically slice the organization into different tribes? Did you take different products where you said, this is the Spotify, I don't know, uh, uh, Apple y y product, and this is, I don't know. How did you how did you slice those initial tribes? Because you wanted to have dependencies as low as possible, I understand. You wanted to ensure yeah. that there is like a lot of collaboration, that there is a lot of consistency. How do you how did you slice them? Yeah, so we uh, uh, we were pretty sure from the beginning, uh, and, and the CTO was that, that uh, you know we, we want to slash it uh, uh, based on features. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than uh, you know tech or, or components, uh, because that was uh, you know that was the terminology everyone used back then. Should we have feature teams or components team, basically? Uh, but we considered some some different angles. Today, it's all about team topologies and stream aligned and sub component system and so on. That, that I think is is more adequate. But back then, it was those were the two main options, uh, and we actually considered both, and we we did attempts at trying to draw up uh, different solutions and and uh, in the end we, we choose that uh, we would have two tribes that are more you know uh, component based or platform as we would call it today so that would be uh, infrastructure and client platform so we wanted uh, dedicated teams to build uh, the frameworks and containers and releases for uh, others to be able to develop quickly on iOS desktop client and and uh, and Android, for instance. And uh, once we decided that it should be featured, because we were into the autonomous idea and we wanted everyone to have a clear mission, uh, we already had those uh, the squad health check that some people may have seen. We already had that going even before the tribes, that each squad should have a clear mission. Uh, people should feel that they can influence what's what's being built and so on. And we realized that that's going to be tricky if, we're, if we have component teams, right? Um, so that's and and then we, we decided you know okay what what makes sense in, as as missions and one was really really clear obviously the music player tribe you know we are a music player so so that that was pretty clear that uh, you know playback and playlist and and search and and ingesting content all that had to do with that would be part of the same tribe then it was a little bit trickier because we had not grown the different cities and parts we were in new york and gothenburg and and, and san francisco uh, and stockholm uh, so the 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 san francisco team was small they were just there to integrate with facebook we call them social uh, mm -hmm. but we had an idea that they need to be lasting there and, and do partnerships and so on and in new york we had a little bit of uh, oh sorry they weren't social social was in new york but never mind uh, uh we had some some different teams in new york and we had some different teams in in stockholm and then we basically just said Okay, this is just enough to make another tribe. So let's, uh, you know, you need more than music to run a music player. We have payments, customer service in Stockholm, for mm -hmm. instance. Let's put them in another tribe then, for convenience, and say that that's called more than music. Uh, okay, we have the same situation actually over in New York. Well, more than music Stockholm, more than music New York. Yeah, good enough. You know, we, let's we don't start have to with be bothered. This. It's pragmatic, you know, mm -hmm. let's start and, and then, you know, but now that we had these concepts and started evolving them, then we could much more consciously, you know, decide how do we want to grow. And and uh, we, would, we would see that payments is eventually going to be a payments tribe, which happened called Iron Bank uh, ads team in, in uh, New York. We knew that when we could become successful, they are going to be a, their own tribe. So we started more moving it towards that called Cream uh, at my time there. Cash rules everything around me from, from Wu-Tang Clan. And I think that that's a, an advice that I often give to, to people, you know, don't get stuck in, in value stream analysis paralysis, which I've seen, seen some tr safe transformations do, yeah. you know, we really get we get it right and you know, start mixing in. But we're not happy with the value streams we have today. Let's think about future value, value streams. And then you have a, you know, big uh, pie in the sky project of, of coming up with new value streams and reorganizing the entire organization in an entirely new way. No, you know, Take smaller steps and start and, and just evolve. Yeah, I, I love this more than music tribe. <laughs> yeah. It's just simple, right? Just integrate everything and then payment at some point, if it becomes too big, becomes its own tribe. Advertising, if it becomes too big, it becomes its own tribe. But for now, let's get started with this and let's experiment so that also everyone builds up some experience in that kind of a setting. Now, 
One thing that I still want to talk about on, on the tribe level is you mentioned that there is a tribe lead and that this tribe lead is responsible basically for making sure that there is a culture within that tribe. Is that tribe lead one person? Is it a group of people? If it's one person, is it from engineering, design, product, or doesn't that even matter? Is it some kind of different role? And how do you ensure a consistent culture across tribe? Or maybe you don't even aim for that. That's a few questions, but uh, I just throw them over and see what you do with them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, so, some big questions as well. But um, in the beginning, when we, when we introduced the tribe model, as I mentioned, the trigger was the CTO having to have more direct reports. And, and then, you know, when we started shaping these tribes and we knew that we, we were going to grow big, uh, we were already growing rapidly. We had lots of venture capital. So, so we knew whatever happens, we're going to grow, right? Uh, and uh, so the, the, the challenge becomes we, we, we want senior, agile people with experience, uh, managers to experience of, 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 you know, large organizations because we had limited experience of that, the CTO even. Uh, so, and, and those were not uh, exactly growing on trees back in 2012. Uh, there weren't a lot of big agile organizations uh, and uh, the, a challenge became, you know, we want you to come, you super experienced person, probably more experienced than me as a CTO to come work at, uh, uh, at Spotify uh, under me. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, one, one thing that we could give back in return was like, you're, you're basically getting your own box. Uh, you can, uh, together with your, the people you recruit or that you develop within the tribe, you can build your culture and, and, you know, show the rest of Spotify how it's done. Uh, and, and that was a, a challenge, I think, uh, uh, got some people going. Uh, so so from, from the beginning, it was that. It was a technology, technology tribe lead. But, you know, also hindsight is 2020 again. Why didn't we immediately consider the same thing in product? Well, because technology and product were separate. Even though they were working very, really closely, the CPO and the CTO, it was easy for the CPO to just, you know, okay, but yeah, that's your concern. And I've seen this over and over and over again in other organizations that the technology or IT and engineering, they are the ones who actually invest much more time in, uh, in you know, thinking about organizations, how should we be organized and so on. I think simply by having been typically much the, the bigger part of an organization who has to think more about how to effectively organize delivery, so to speak. So soon enough, we, we actually introduced the product tribe lead when we started even hire, hiring and, and introducing more, more layers in, in the product organization. But that also coincided with the uh, advent of, of uh, Rochelle King from Netflix, who, who were tasked with building this design organization that I mentioned. Uh, and she had worked successfully with the old triad concept that I think actually predates uh, agile, you know, tech design, and uh, product working as a trio on all levels of the organizations, actually. So she was a strong advocate for that. So, so we, we introduced tribe lead trios. Mm -hmm. So all tribes should now have a product tribe lead, tech tribe lead, and design tribe lead. But as we were building the design tribe lead organization, the, the, the D part was, was always a little bit weaker. And the, the, some people would have to you know, be the design tribe lead of two tribes or you know, more on paper because not all tribes were ready for, for a design tribe lead. Um, yeah, so so I think that was turned out to be a successful pattern, but it also varies in some organizations like infrastructure and operations. They had their own concept because tribes were free to, to go with whatever, whatever they chose. And uh, uh, they called it honchos uh, because they, they were a merge from infrastructure and operations. Bam. And they had two managers on, on kind of the same level and they said, okay, who's, who of us is going to be the technology tribe lead then? Uh, both. Okay, both. Great. Oh, we have this senior agile coach and she's really supporting us in a great way. Uh, why not the three of us? And, and they called themselves the honchos and it was two tech guys and, 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 uh, and uh, an agile coach. Agile coach. Yeah. And so, these days I, I, I learned that Spotify also have a fourth in many cases, which is an insights tribe lead just to show how much this uh, product insights and, and, and strategy insights are for, for you know, uh, steering the tribe in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will get back to that. I just have one question in between, uh, which is, we, you, you also introduced the concept of chapters, 
which is, for example, like engineering, and then you have this chapter lead. And that chapter lead mm -hmm. had become primarily um, a person responsible for people development, not taking like technological or engineering decisions. Um, to yep. what extent is the chapter lead, which is also, it, there could be a product chapter lead, if I'm not mistaken, right? Design chapter lead, engineering chapter lead, or is that is that wrong? Correct right. me on that. No, no, actually, so so that was also a thing that came out of technology. So that mm -hmm. was basically it. So it was only technology. So there was a backend chapter lead, okay. uh, QA chapter lead, uh, mobile chapter lead. Once mobile, went, once we went mobile first, there was a Android chapter lead and an iOS chapter lead. Then came as things were, were developing a machine learning engineer, a data okay. uh, or, or okay. data chapter and so on. So, okay, and those so, and those various chapter company. leads basically would be reporting to the tribe lead, the technical tribe yes. lead. The okay, tribe that, lead, that yeah. makes sense. That makes sense. And the product owners would be reporting to the product tribe lead. And they would have a, a chapter-like concept also in product uh, in many cases, but but the, they just didn't call it chapter because that was a technology thing. Yeah, and no chapter was bigger than ten people. So if you had lots of backend developers, which was the case in some tribes, you would have several uh, backend chapters and several chapter leads. Okay, okay, I get that. Now um, the other question that I had brought up was the tribe leads being responsible for the culture within their tribe. Did they also try to make sure that the culture was consistent across tribes? Uh, or was that well, not even on the agenda? Could be. No, I, I think it, it's it's uh, it was, but in a in another sense, I mean, on a company level, we work with these things like values and co-creating values across all the offices, and and we worked on a, a lot on introduction and onboarding and workshopping these things. So, 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 uh, and I think a heavy influence from Swedish culture is uh, more consensus seeking and uh, you know have, having very informal and relaxed relationships with managers that we, that we took with us to the US, where we also had generous. Uh, uh, vacation plans, uh, you know, four week vacations uh, from uh, from the start, which is twice the amount of what many in the US had. They didn't even know what to do with the vacation. We introduced six months parental leave retroactively for, for kids up to three years. I had a, a, a guy in my tribe in Boston. He got one and a half uh, years leave like like that. And so so that's part of culture. And and, and the other so you, you're probably aware of, of uh, expressions as uh, um, culture follows follows structure and, and you can't change culture and so on. Uh, we, I don't want to debate that. I, I think me, maybe there's a little bit of both. But but uh, so in that sense, you could say that we were all uh, focusing a lot on our way of working, talking about squads, chapters, tribes. What what are they doing? These autonomous squad health checks and, and you know, Agile or Spotify. And, and, and that was you know, reinforcing what principles do we have? How do we work? Uh, that the uh, design or the, the director of design and product uh, uh, tribe leader, CPO even, had really clear ideas on how we should be working. Uh, well, product discovery and, and influenced by also how Google and Netflix and others were doing things. That that is part of them shaping culture. The expectations they put on on the the tribe leads who put the, those expectations on the team. And as I said, I think we were good at, uh, you know, telling the, the stories that we tell about ourselves, uh, mm -hmm. to ourselves, telling these stories, and also acknowledging that, you know, going to town halls, going to meetings, going to workshops, going to all of these things uh, that uh, engineers have a hard time to find time for in most organizations. And should they really be here? You know, shouldn't they be just coding and delivering? But we, we, we value that uh, immensely. So, so we were more like, Concerned that not more engineers were coming to more things like that, and it make, making it more even more easy for them to attend and record things and make it available online. So, so in that sense, we worked on a, a cross tribes culture, but we weren't concerned that, uh, for instance, in New York, the first tribe more than Music New York, they were uh, uh, they had old school engineering managers, you know, you know where they were kind of. Uh, managing work tasks and so on and, and they were the ones talking with the product owner some agile coaches you know frowned <laughs> uh, but uh, uh you know th they were allowed to to find their own way they they soon moved to chapter leads by the way and, and, and 
But that made me think actually about another mistake that we did. Uh, that's uh, kind of vital because this this is a big misconception on the Spotify model. Because if you read the white paper, it says the chapter lead is as half time individual contributor and and half time manager. Uh, we we very quickly moved away from that uh, because it it turned out that uh, that that it's very difficult. You can't do that. No, almost no one could. Uh, so, and I would say ninety five or ninety nine percent of all the chapter leads at Spotify were one hundred percent. Uh, just managers uh, of within a year uh, from that. So yeah. So you mentioned already the the Swedish culture, and earlier yeah. you mentioned that you moved from a single tribe lead to a tribe lead trio, and in some cases today now four people. That also means that, or at least that's my assumption, that there is some sort of shared leadership. And I can imagine this working well with the Scandinavian culture, culture with the Swedish culture. You already mentioned, like consensus-driven, very collaborative. How did that work at other locations, mainly the U.S., which has a very different culture than Sweden has? Yeah. Well, it, it both it bo both worked and didn't, in a sense. Uh, I think also uh, there were a lot of Swedish people and French people and so on uh, and other nationalities in the U.S. Uh, to start, but uh, uh, and I think that uh, uh, senior leaders had a pretty heavy presence uh, in the New York office, especially in the uh, the early formative days. Uh, we also had uh, people who had been Americans who had been working in Sweden for quite some time who went back to the US and, and uh, came into tribe lead positions. So, so in that sense, it, it was a little bit easier to to keep the, the cultures aligned. Uh, and this is anecdotal, of course, but I, I noticed that uh, it felt more like in, in the US, uh, uh, there are some tendencies, such tendencies in Sweden as well, but in the US even more that, uh, you know, you got to be a manager because you were good at, you know, taking initiative, making things happen and, and had a little bit of a harder time to let go and see, okay, how can I coach and challenge my my employees to actually, you know, increase their capability and commitment to solve problems rather than, you know, go and solve it for them and and uh, show how great I am and, and you know, get promoted. Uh, and also I noticed a little bit more of a reluctance to do things uh, before it had been, you know, formally approved or, or informally approved or signed off by the manager you know yeah that sounds like a great idea maybe we should check with uh, yeah let's let's wait until yeah you know the, the tribe lead isn't here today the, let's 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 push it to next week and and yeah so, so more of a, a respect uh, uh, for that I, I heard a study mention that uh, you know Sweden is only second to the Netherlands in how likely you are to just ignore your your boss you know, oh, that's your opinion. You know, so I'm going to go and do something else. <laughs> I so, wasn't so aware that the uh, Netherlands were that up, that high up on that list. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have to check the source someday. But I've been using that. Uh, a lot. Germany is definitely further down the list. There is more obedience in yeah. Germany than than there is in, in in Sweden, I guess. So let's let's use this um, cultural difference from different geographies to also make a segue into. The, the third topic that I wanted to cover with you today, which is adopting this to other organizations. I don't know when it was, but at some time, at some point you published that white paper. Uh, Henrik created his famous video, Agile Engineering Culture at Spotify, one and two. A lot of consulting companies, I think, who never worked within Spotify took that video. I've seen slides that they've created with screenshots from that video. And ultimately, also thanks to them, this whole model, this approach of scaling agile product development became very popular. And I think uh, you mentioned in 2017, yeah, 2017, you left Spotify, you joined Crisp. And my assumption is there were a lot of organizations looking for help in implementing that model. And who better to reach out to than someone who was part of building that model? So they, so they came to you. Now, walk me through some of the organizations that you supported. What, um, I mean, I assume I know the challenges that they were facing, but you can also share those with us. But how did you ultimately approach implementing that model or parts of it into those organizations? And 
where did you see big successes and where did you see the need for bigger adaptations because of the organizations being so fundamentally different, be it the industry that they played in, the geography that they were located in, whatever, right? Share, walk us through yeah. some of those experiences that you had over the past now five years. Sure. So uh, I, I'm going to have to make you a little bit disappointed to, to just uh, right off the bat because, uh, you know, you can, you can think that five years is a long time, but uh, I also have a tendency to, uh, you know, want to stay with an organization and, and see the results. So I, I haven't been with that many organizations. All good. I, 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 <laughs> and, 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 or I, I've actually came in touch with lots of them, but uh, then on the other hand, I haven't been following them closely enough to, to make a, a lot of so, so that's a, that's a disclaimer but but yeah i have i have some 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 stories to tell so so first off actually when when i uh left spotify i came in touch with an organization that was was uh re reaching out to uh, to crisp because of the spotify model and, and hendrix association with it uh and i had not even you know fully left spotify at the time when I took this uh, engagement on and there was a manager, they were now insourcing people and they wanted to, okay, now we have to think about how we should be organized. We need more managers uh, and how should they be organized? And we want to be cost effective, of course. And, and, you know, from the white paper, it was like, wow, chapter lead. Everyone's talking about Spotify and this chapter lead thing seems like, you know, great because they're half time managers and half time, uh, individual contributors so that's a, that's a cost save right and and that's a, a, an idea that i've o also heard since in, in other places so, so so i pretty early on explained that no I, I don't think you can expect that and 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 in an organization that's not really you know fully agile there's going to be a lot of work for the engineering managers and and your idea that they're going to have you know 20 or 30 direct reports uh, no that that's and be uh, contributing so, but we, I started to become a sounding board for for this manager on on how to approach uh, actually this um, you know how should we how should we do with with our organization and uh, sometimes at Spotify I felt like are we just reinventing the wheel are we coming up with department or, or and team all over and 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 just slapping a new name on it uh, but as I mentioned with the tribe thing, we actually sp spent a lot of time thinking about what is really the point and, and then also following up and see, are we actually using it in a good way, tweaking it, changing the chapter lead role and so on. And when I asked this manager at the company and, and, and no shadow should be cast, cast over them, but uh, uh, because this is I've, I've seen again and again that, okay, what's the role of management in, in, in this organization? It's like wow, I've I've never really thought about it. I've never seen it that way. Oh, I have to think about that one. And it was like you a week later with amazed, like wow, yeah, such a powerful question. It's like wow, thank you. I'm here all week, uh, and um, it it turned out that uh, uh, a lot of of this, you know, figuring out what to do in an ad ad transformation journey is even though we didn't transform at, at Spotify, I find, find it's the same things. You know, thinking deeply about what are we actually trying to achieve? Will this help? Will that help? Should we do this or that? So when they later started an agile transformation, they contacted me and said, we heard great things about you. Uh, can you come and help us? We need someone from outside the industry. And they had already decided to go with the Spotify model because a business unit in another country had that. So, so I didn't even, you know, I've so never suggested it. I've never suggested it. I was more sorry. Oh, are you sure you're going to do that? What does it even mean? Uh, that kind of thing. But they were very open and they really want to make drastic changes, kind of. So uh, what I did, what, one thing that I learned, for instance, that I didn't actually get to in the safe and Spotify model, making the most of both that you mentioned, was that uh, I knew that lean portfolio management, lean agile budgeting works. I saw that I saw that firsthand at, at Spotify. That's how we did things, you know. Uh, but I had never taken, you know, I knew very little about Copex and OPEX and, and all these things that they were concerned about. And, and, you know, how do we convince the people? How do we explain in a good way what's broken and wrong and, and why we should do this? And, and I accidentally had taken a safe training and, and accidentally had become a safe program consultant. And, and I found lots of useful material. Uh, around lean portfolio management, lean agile budgeting. So we actually used that as a toolbox on, on, and I pointed them to some links and articles. We never did any safe training. We never did any, 
you know, um, certifications or anything like that. And also, you know, how do we how do we coordinate these tribes? I, I mean, at Spotify, when we had tribes, they were pretty autonomous, and we didn't need a lot of uh, PI planning and so on. We had reduced our, our dependencies or work worked around them. While I would say safe is a way of just managing and coordinating all these dependencies. So also there we found inspiration. You know, oh, PA planning, maybe that that's something. But you know, if you read about PA planning, uh, especially back then, uh, you could see that there, were, there were pretty pretty nice things uh, and ideas floating around in those articles. And I think a part of of why safe uh, comes across as dogmatic and you know, PA planning done in a bad way is is actually that most people don't read the articles and then figure out what's what's applicable to, to my stuff and, and what can I learn from this. But they actually go to a training where it's much more prescriptive and you get you you know you simulate and practice and then you know go okay then I'm gonna do exactly the same as I taught in practice and in, in, in the training. So we had a much more loosely organized you know big room planning we called it and, and it was more about communicating goals. It was a big social event where people were you know, one complaint in the old organization was that I don't even know who to go to if I need, I, I don't understand the priorities and I don't know who owns this thing and I don't know who to talk to, to to even find out if we're on track on these things. And now just organizing is in squads that owns different things, tribes that owns an area, it's became super clear and then meeting regularly every three months and actually getting a face on these people and learning together how to actually collaborate and communicate. Those and, and I, I, that's the point, like forging these social re relationships and getting this clarity on, on who's who in the organization was, was immensely useful. Um, and uh, something you learned quickly was that I've been involved with, with several clients who have had uh, a substantial part of their IT uh, outsourced. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, well, but, and, and they said, both of them said early on, you know, we're not touching that. Uh, it, it, it's it's successful for us because we've re reduced costs so much, uh, and uh, so so that's not this this agile transformation thing should not be a, a, a question of, of whether to insource or not. But then you know when when, when people start understanding and being bought into this uh, whole empowered teams, uh, engineering needs to be strong. They need to be understand the company, how the company makes money uh, so, so we can innovate together. They need to be involved in the decisions. It's like, hmm, are, are we talking about, you know, our offshore partners now? They are going to be invested and, and, and uh, coming up. It's just a black box to us and we don't even know who they are and we don't see them on camera. It's not not likely, right? So, so that started in 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 both of, of the big clients I work with. More of a, okay, we actually need to think about how to insource, and I think that's actually why the chapter model has become popular. And McKinsey has been pushing the Spotify model because it's the whole thing. You know, if you look at Spotify, Google, Netflix, what really sets them apart, the focus on talent, talent acquisition, talent development. You know. A product tribe lead at Spotify, uh, and as Kagan says about product leaders in, in his books, maybe 80% of the time is spent on staffing and coaching people. In most other organizations or those who introduce SAFE, it's like 0%, maybe, it seems realistic, 5% uh, if you're lucky. So the chapter model lends itself really well to that, because if you imagine, and we actually tried that in, in, in one of the organizations, they were, they were implementing it differently. In one, they had a chapter, and the chapter lead was, you know, I'm head of all the Scrum Masters. I'm going to build the best Scrum Master community in the world and the best Scrum Masters in the world. They were all working as Scrum Masters, and they, every time they got together, they started making schemes on how to, how to develop themselves and what's our idea, what great would look like, what can we do, how can we collaborate together to push, uh, you know, a great culture of, of, of Scrum and so on. And then I had another manager in the same system you know, they were had 30 people reporting to them, uh, a business developer, a tester, a backend engineer, an iOS engineer, and, and you know, everyone and, 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 and their, their aunt. And, and when they get together, you know, what, what do they talk about? Let's, uh, yeah, it's impossible to build a good, great engineering culture. And then it becomes much trickier to attract people to come and work for you as a, as a boss in, in this chapter that's not a chapter. So the chapter model is great for for actually you know building an engineering culture and a craftsmanship culture and then uh, you know we're all in this together. Let's figure out what uh, what what great Java development looks like in in this company. 
and basically getting you know getting to the realization in banks and telcos and so on that whoa we outsourced a lot of people or we've, we've lost a lot of our talent how do we actually get it back but now when it seems to be harder than ever and i think that's that's one of the keys that's one of the keys and and i wanted to go back to something that you mentioned at the very beginning of our conversation which is that the whole organization was built around the making these autonomous squads successful and when I think about a lot of the organizations that I work with, be it pharma companies, med tech, automotive, banking, whatever, very rarely do they consider their teams, squads, whatever terminology they use as, as the ultimate unit. Maybe they speak about it sometimes, but they don't create the environment around it. And you mentioned, for example, one of the elements of that environment is leadership. And how does leadership see itself, right? What is the role of management here? Am I dedicated to developing these people and forming a great team out of them? Or am I still like looking at controlling them and being an individual contributor myself and, and all of this? And I was wondering while you were speaking about the organ other organizations that you work with, what did it take to really not only raise the awareness, but also have them follow through on creating these autonomous squads, providing them with the right environment. Because I believe once you do that, a lot of the other things take care of themselves. Once they have the autonomy, they will figure out how to align better. Once they have the autonomy, they will come up with better ideas, better products, better service for customers. Now, how do you not only raise the awareness, but also have them follow through on this? Yeah, so uh, many parts of this question, but one, one that, uh, that I, I really agree with the, the observation that, uh, you know, many organizations talk about teams and agile teams and how important the teams are, uh, but then they are not really following through on that. Uh, leaders are not, uh, uh, they have a limited understanding of what does it actually take? What, what are the requirements that need to be in place for a team to be successful? And how am I as a manager, you know, responsible for, for putting that in place? For one, one really simple thing, team size. Wherever I go, the teams are too big. Uh, and, uh, you know, does the team even have a clear mission or purpose? No. Uh, is it clear who's on the team or not? And, and I'm basically citing the list from Hackman's research on, on, on effective teams here. Yep. And, and most of those conditions, you know, do you, have, do you have customer feedback loops in place that you can, so you know if you meet or exceed the expectations of your customers and users? No, not really. Uh, maybe if you're lucky, you have a demo, but that's not really a, a, a true uh, feedback loop. Uh, it, it's better than nothing for sure, depending on what you do. And uh, yeah, and, 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 you know, it was management or, or the organization, even if it was not you as a manager who, who created this system or this way of working uh, at some point, and, and you're the only one who can change it. So it does, if I'm brought into an organization to coach the teams and, you know, can you help us be more effective with Scrum? And I see that very few of the conditions are in place. I, I find that I, I have to coach the manager, right? Not, not, and not the team. Uh, so that's key, I think, to, to get their eyes uh, open to uh, how much they actually need to involve, uh, be involved in, in building effective teams. And this is what I also see people struggle with because, and, and that's so telling of SAFE, there's no, you know, manager uh, training really and not no dedicated one it's only the you know leading safe which is, which is too abstract nothing about how should we change be changing behaviors what can we do one key concept that we introduced from spotify that i didn't think would work at spotify and, and no, i didn't really believe in it uh, outside of spotify was the potluck uh, the product owner and, and team lead or chapter lead and the agile coach would be working together and potluck is you know when everyone brings something to the party to eat so it was bringing different perspectives, so kind of play with words. We call it squad trio uh, with clients, for instance, and, and also at Spotify sometimes. But, you know, just putting them in the same room every week, having a meeting. Okay, we're all responsible for this squads or team's success. I'm mm -hmm. from a product perspective. I'm from a management organization perspective. And I'm from an agile coaching team collaboration perspective. We need to be aligned. We need to be supporting each other. I need to understand what's important with product, with management. You need to understand what's important with an agile way of working. And together we can observe different perspectives, work the different angles and, and together contribute behind the scenes, not as a, you know, a management team, but behind the scenes. How can we collaborate to, to challenge and support the team? 
And that turned out to be a key in, in transformations because, uh, you know, agile manager, uh, the manager here is that you, you're going to be hands off and, uh, you know, not be giving work orders and so on. Yeah. But you're supposed to support the team. But you might not have all your direct reports in the team. And, and how am I going to do this? And, and there is this new role, the scrum master, the product owner. They're also uh, working with the team. So uh, I don't want to step on their toes and they're new in their roles. And and we, we really that, uh, uh, realized that a way of, of actually, you know, untying that knot or unmaking that knot was to just, just put them in the room, say you're responsible together. Uh, and that's actually bringing me back to a part of a, an answer that I forgot about the uh, responsibility of management, management. But we had this idea or principle at Spotify that you're collectively responsible, yeah. individually accountable, yeah. but collectively responsible. So everyone in the leadership team or everyone in the team will be collectively responsible. So then you might have someone who's individually accountable to make sure that some issues are, are driven or, or, or on the agenda. So product for, for product things, there's not that doesn't mean that they should be the ones doing it, but they need to make sure that the entire team are focused on, on, on these things. Yeah. So, so that's, that's, uh, that's a key, but yeah, it's your question was much broader than that. Uh, no, 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 so... you, you, you answered it well. So uh, at least for me, I, I, I got the, I got the, 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 like the missing pieces together. Now, as we're approaching the end of our time box, uh, Joachim, I, I want to ask a final question and that ties into Ooh. what you just shared about, about leadership. You mentioned, if I remember correctly, that at Spotify, it was the CTO who started a lot of these things, uh, getting scrum masters, agile coaches in, but also like at some point saying, hey, uh, 20 direct reports, that too, that's too much for me, which triggered the creation of the tribes, etc. Based on what I saw in the Netflix series and what I uh, read from you on, on LinkedIn, uh, Daniel, the, the founder, also played a huge role in in how he obviously led that company ultimately to success. Now, when you work with organizations that are trying to sh change their structures, their culture, their way of working, their mode of collaboration, all of that, none of these frameworks, not safe, not less, not Spotify, covers what top management needs to do. But I believe they do play a huge role what is your perspective on them on that and how do you help them if you agree that they play a huge role them playing that role and what would that role be absolutely so uh uh yeah it's 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 almost saddening you know as as a as an advocate or champion for for uh uh you know a a way of working that's all about empowering teams and and have people in the edges or the front line you know uh use their their uh, authority where the information is and and really innovate and and uh yeah come up with good things and and a, a sad part of of actually how change uh, works is that uh, uh change initiatives where where senior management are clear on where where you're headed and they are actually modeling the behavior are you know several times more likely to succeed uh, than the ones where they don't model it where they don't uh, we, we look to these leaders so they're vital uh, for uh, uh, any big change to succeed and as soon as you start sensing that they're only saying this or they only ordered this but they're not really aware of what it is and and they're not living these values and and you know, as, start, as soon as people on the floor uh, start sensing that, that you, 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 you know, they're not going to be as committed to, to the change. And uh, I was recently at Scrum Gathering Belgrade, and, and there was a guy who, who in his talk said uh, that uh, transformations, uh, you can't buy it. You need to sweat it. Uh, and I think that's, that's really, really true. They need to sweat it. They, they need to be aligned and they need to work out these things. And... Uh, I worked with some leadership teams and I all the time I come back to to a book uh, and the concept that was introduced to me by my first tribe lead uh, one of my first tribe leads uh, five dysfunctions of a team Patrick Lencioni a yeah. lot of people know it and it seems to be the same in many 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 leadership teams and that's why it's so popular they're not really a real team it's not their first team the CMO goes back to marketing that's their team the CFO to finance and so on and when they meet as a as a lead team you know, there's so many things they have to go through and they, they're not really working together and they, they re rarely have a shared understanding and shared vision of what they need to do. So ideally, I would work on, okay, what is your vision? What, what do you want to achieve? 
wh where do you want to go with this transformation? Why why are you even doing this? You know, uh, and and really have to have have them work through that, because even if they have uh, you know did done some work on on what's the vision and what do we want to do, uh, it often stops with you know oh safe says that. Uh, these are the goals that we're going to reach. It's productivity and predictability is going to increase. So, oh, yeah, let's take them as goals. And it's like, then they didn't really do the job themselves. Yeah. But even if they do the job themselves and say, oh, faster, better quality and so on. Okay, what does that really mean? And it's not until you start digging into the details. Like we had one one executive team that we worked with. There were like, everyone agreed on transparency. And then when we started digging down, okay, what does that mean? What 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 are some things you could do to increase transparency? What are, what is a metric that you would watch to to actually see that you're on the right way, you know, you're on the right path? And then some some people started. Well, uh, first thing is that we need to make all these strategy documents uh, available and, and make sure that they're shared. And, and someone else was like, whoa, whoa, stop! No, we can't do that. That's uh, I mean, that's not what I meant. And, and now you start getting through this groan zone of, of actually working it out. Because I think on a high level, everyone agrees. Do you want to be more agile? Yes. I mean, if that means flexible, of course. Do you want to have better quality? Of course. Do you want to be faster? Give it to me. You know, but but you know, if if you don't really dig down to it, into it and start seeing what the trade-offs are, and and you're like, yes, we're going to introduce all of this agile thing and empowerment and and uh, let the team. Uh, uh, come up with things, but we still need to also have the same control mechanisms, reports, projects, and, and wait, you, you have to realize some things have to give. Uh, and, and if they haven't worked through that, it, it's going to be very, very difficult to get anywhere. Yeah, I love that piece. You have to sweat it. You can't buy it. I think yeah. that's that's really true. Um, for the people that are in the teams, there, there it's very normal, but also for leadership, learn and role modeling, all of that, um, incredible. Thank you, Joachim. Um, final question. If people want to get in touch with you, how should they approach this? So it's my first, ma first name dot last name at gmail.com. So it's, uh, it's simple. Uh, reach out to me. Uh, there's also my website, joachimsanden.com. Uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, the, the clue is it's my name uh, in, in all of these uh, instances you just have to show them my name and spell it right and, and then we'll, we'll think, link uh, we'll link your linkedin profile and your website in, in the show notes all right yeah. thank you and so I much say, I, i'm super happy to learn more about people who have applied the spotify model or been inspired by it what, what are you doing what are you learning what are you taking away so if you have those stories i'd be happy to jump on a video call and, and just chat away and maybe share some some experience of mine yeah, I think that's a, that's a great offer to, to the community out there, to everyone that wants to learn, that wants to experiment. Joachim, thank you so much for, for joining this conversation today. I certainly learned a lot, and I'm sure this is not going to be the last time that we speak to each other. So have a great evening, and uh, everyone else, bye-bye. Thank you for having me. Bye. bye.